Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And first of all, just a couple quick announcements. We have some great programs coming up, starting with one tonight. Um, herbal Remedies for Cold and Flu Symptoms with Master Herbalist Sabrina Seitz. She's an instructor for the Wellness Farm Institute, firmly grounded in plant-based nutrition, but she really has some great ideas for inexpensive, accessible remedies to help relieve symptoms while you're waiting for your body to recover and get better. Uh, so that's going on. And then Monday, February 11th is our next intro to plant-based nutrition. For those of you who have not taken that class yet, it's a 90 minute class power packed with all kinds of great information uh, to teach you the eating plan and how to get started implementing it. So if you're a new member, old member, you want to make sure you get on that call. And then Wednesday, February 13th is the next conversations with Dr. Pam. That's me. And I'm going to talk about herpes prevention and treatment for the first 15 minutes. And then I'll take any questions you want to ask ask, of course, about diet, health, and medicine. So I have a couple of topics for today, and the first one is acne and diet. Um, I think almost all Americans experience acne at some point in time. I remember reading something back when I was in school, something like 80% of the population at some point in time has to deal with acne. It was once thought of as something that really afflicted teenagers and you sort of grew out of it, but um, I can say from a clinical perspective, the number of people showing up here in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s and 70s who are still dealing with acne is significant. And in fact, the medical journals reflect that it's a growing problem in an aging population. Um, the real cause, I mean, there are a lot of drugs used to treat acne, and some of them have unbelievably difficult and heinous side effects, but the real cause is diet. The best way to address it is to convert to a wellness forum style diet. Now, acne develops when the hair follicles and their sebaceous glands become blocked and inflamed, and there are a lot of things that contribute to this, ranging from uh, the presence of bacteria and immune function to hormones, and all of these things are affected by diet, of course. Now I've written before about the effect of dairy consumption on uh, acne and actually a lot of people think it's the saturated fat which is not good for you but the studies actually show and I have quoted several of these in our curriculum book and in books that I've written that the effects of low fat dairy products on acne are far worse in many cases than the effects of full fat dairy. So it tells us the protein is probably the, the causative factor. Um, now, in terms of looking at overall diet, obviously getting the dairy out of your diet, I just can't say it enough times that there's anybody watching this who's still eating this miserable stuff, this would be a good time to quit. But um, from a broader perspective, the dietary pattern that seems to uh, prevent acne, um, there are some populations in which acne is still relatively unknown. For example, the Kitavan Islanders of Papua New Guinea and the Ashe Hunter Gatherers of Paraguay. I'm not sure I pronounced that one right, but um, anyway, these are two such populations. An examination of 1,200 of the Kitavan and um, about 300 of the Ashe uh, shows that, or 115 of the Ashe population shows that there's virtually no acne in these populations. So now let's look at the diets of these people. The Kitavan eat a 70% carbohydrate diet. Does that sound familiar? kind of close to ours, almost all from whole plant foods such as tuber fruit, tubers, fruit, and vegetables. Almost no intake of things like dairy, alcohol, coffee, tea, oils, margarine, sugar, salt, cereal. About 20% of calories are from fat, so they're eating a relatively low-fat plant-based diet. Hmm, go figure, right? The Ashe diet's very similar with an emphasis on foods like rice and corn. They eat a few more Western foods than the Papua New Guinea Islanders, but um, just a few things like pasta, a little bit of flour, sugar, and bread. And noted in the same paper as this, these population studies, by the way, is the fact that acne was virtually unknown in Okinawa prior to World War II. Um, an examination of close to 10,000 school children showed that um, kids between the ages of 6 and 16 had virtually no acne at all. So it's definitely a food-borne illness. Acne is just one more negative byproduct of eating a terrible diet uh, based on meat, dairy, and junk food. The condition of the skin really is reflective of the internal condition of the body. So it's, it's kind of like an early warning sign that changes are needed. Our experience here is that within a few short weeks of adopting a low fat, whole foods, plant-based diet with lots of fresh filtered water, and people start to lose weight, their health starts to improve, and then their skin starts to reflect the um, appearance of of a healthy, um, healthier person and to reflect the improved health within the body. So there's no reason to treat this foodborne illness with drugs and there's no reason for people to suffer with not only the, the disease of acne, if you want to call it that, but some of the psychological effects of having acne, which make people self-conscious about their appearance and 
and that sort of thing. It's easily fixed with diet in almost all instances. Um, now the second topic, I've been getting a lot of emails about this lately, is um, is there really a flu epidemic this year? Um, you know, the Cochrane Collaboration says the flu vaccine is useless. They've put out several articles to that effect, and they've also um, put out a lot lately about this horrible scandal involving Tamiflu, and the World Health Organization the Centers for Disease Control continue to recommend this useless drug in spite of the fact that there aren't any studies showing it's useful. But um, anyway, the headlines every day are, you know, that you better go get your flu shot because we're having an epidemic. Well, I was getting ready to respond um, and do something that I could put out en masse, like through this vehicle, when our local newspaper, the Columbus Dispatch, delivered a wonderful gift. This was Saturday morning, Friday or Saturday morning last week, in the form of an article that explained how local authorities determine the incidence of flu. The headline was, Scourge of Flu Remains Strong, Multifaceted System Measures Prevalence. Boy, doesn't that sound official, right? Well, here are some excerpts from the article that basically explain how you can manufacture an epidemic if you are a health authority. Um, Tracking individual flu cases is next to impossible, the article said. Even if they go to a doctor, they might be sent home with a prescription based on symptoms alone, but no test to confirm the flu. These are health authorities talking to the reporter from the Columbus Dispatch. Instead of actual counts, local, state, and federal health agencies use a relatively new tool called syndrome surveillance, a mix of data sources including positive flu specimens at state labs, emergency department visits for flu-like symptoms, and hospital admissions for flu-like related, flu-related illnesses. The system also uses less traditional sources, and this is where it gets interesting, including thermometer and cold medicine sales at drugstores and Google searches for information about the flu. Are you kidding me? We are measuring the number of Google searches in Ohio for flu, and we're allowing that to determine the incidence of flu. Well, in addition to figuring out how many Central Ohioans looked up flu on the internet or bought a thermometer at a drugstore, I mean, I, I don't know how these people say this stuff with a straight face. The geniuses at the health department figure in school absences and pediatric urgent care visits for flu-like illnesses and respiratory symptoms. The article included a proud quote from an epidemiologist with the Columbus Department of Health who said, quote, we look at many different indicators. It helps to get a broad picture. Well, I thought of some indicators that they're not looking at that I think would be great. Somebody could stand at the shopping malls and count the number of people who walk by and sneeze while they're walking by. Health officials could be stationed in movie theaters to measure the number of times people cough while watching the film. And we could have authorities in public places keeping track of the number of people with puffy eyes, gray skin, or other visible symptoms of illness, and we could categorize all of those people as having the flu. Nonetheless, this incredible diligence in applying the scientific method allows authorities to, quote, this is what they said in the article, determine what kind of public health message is necessary. Well, of course, the public health message is there's the threat of an epidemic and you must get your flu vaccine. I think this is the best article I've seen offering a public explanation that actually quotes these people, um, the shenanigans that they go through to create fear in the population. While the tactics are kind of disgusting, I did find myself laughing. In fact, I think the next time that I go to Walmart or someplace like that, they talk to me about having a flu vaccine, I'll just start laughing hysterically and they can follow their flu vaccine recommendation with a recommendation that I take psychiatric drugs. <laughs> well, anyway, that's all for now. Have a wonderful day. I'll be back to you on Thursday. And as usual, pass this along to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it.